I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 3rd of October, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. And today it's kind of a big day for me because my baby, my uh, oldest daughter, who is turning 15 in just weeks next month, but weeks away, it's her quinceanera, of course, is getting her braces on in just about an hour and a half from the time that I'm recording this. And tomorrow, coincidentally, is my 20 year wedding anniversary. And so this is kind of a day of retrospection for me, like the whole idea that we've now had kids for 75% of our life and for how much of their lives we've lived abroad and kind of, so it's just kind of a personal day here on the vlog, but we're gonna, we're gonna get to that after the bump. this bit of today's video while I'm actually standing here waiting for them to arrive with my daughter Liesl from, excuse me, with my daughter Liesl from the dentist. Her, her braces were put on about 30 minutes ago and that was her adventure for the day. About two o'clock this afternoon, she went in to see Dr. Betsy and getting braces, which you'll have for the next two to three years. Now she's 14, she's turning 15 next month. We have her quinceanera coming up. We're all very excited about that, uh, having it here in Leon. And of course, we're very excited that people will be coming to that. This is a really big event for her, really the biggest that she will have uh, during this part of her life, right? She's not gonna have a graduation party from high school because she homeschools. She's not gonna have a prom because she doesn't go to a school and they don't do proms here. All those kinds of events she doesn't have. So her quinceanera is a really big deal. Uh, we've known for many years, 10 years probably, that braces were going to be a necessity. And with my teeth being the way that they are, we've always known that it was a likelihood. My daughter, Luciana, who's a little bit younger, is expecting to get hers in six to 12 months. We'll see exactly when they recommend them, but uh, Liesl got them on today. So I am a father waiting for my daughter to arrive on her first, uh, first moments with braces. And we're about to have our first meal that she has to deal with with braces. So I've not seen her or heard how she's doing yet, but um, I know she was not actually feeling too badly going in to do it this morning. She's overall been very positive about knowing that she was getting braces. I know it can be a very stressful thing because it's, it's years of your life and a huge impact on your everyday living. Um, but she's had a really good attitude about it and she knows she wants to get her teeth corrected and have them be as healthy and attractive as possible. Um, and so she is like uh, very rational about the entire process and being like, I, I know I need to do it. And I'm really excited about how the results are gonna be at the end. I, just, I don't wanna do it now, like exactly how one would hope that you would be uh, in doing something like that. So that's, so that's something we have going on today. And I wanted to take a moment to say that because it's happening in real time. Like I'm actually sitting here, in, standing here in the rain, uh, doing a little bit of recording today talking about how that that is happening um and then of course tomorrow is my 20th wedding anniversary and 20 years i think really hits you that you know this is yeah, up until now, I feel like we've really kind of felt like still newlyweds in a lot of ways. Our life tends to be a lot of adventure. And in our first five years, we moved constantly. We're busy starting a company. It was already five years old when we met, but we were really trying to get it going somewhere, trying to make it, you know, starting a company is tough. I um, mean, those first years were, were very, uh, we were young and the company was young. Um, we were newly married. There's just so much going on. We were constantly moving and, and just trying different things in life. And then it's funny because it feels like we were married a long time before we started having children, but we had our daughter Liesl just five years and less than two months after we had gotten married. So Liesl is turning 15 next month and our wedding anniversary is tomorrow. 20 years. Uh, for those who are watching the show, it's on October 4th, not on the day you see the show. So we'll be past the anniversary by the time you see the episode, but I'm recording this actually on the third. Uh, so, so even, you know how it works. Okay. But it felt like so much time that we were without kids. It really felt like, and I'm really glad we had those five years because we really established like who we were as a couple and we you know, discovered a lot of our interest in life and um, we managed to do a little bit of travel before she was born, enough that it really encouraged us to do more. We had already made the decision that we wanted our kids to grow up at least partially abroad. Um, so all those things we had done in, in a relatively short amount of time and really established ourselves professionally. We had really good careers, really good resumes, 
companies were able to do a lot of things. We were in a really good shape by the time uh, that Liesl came along. But it's funny now to think that we are in just a few weeks going to be at 75% of our married lives together that we have had children. That seems crazy. Even though in some ways our children have been around long enough that it's hard to imagine that there was ever a time that we didn't have them. In reality, it also feels like, but they've only been a small percentage of our adult lives, and that is not true. They've been here, the majority of them. Uh, so they've watched us grow as much as just about anyone. So it's, a, it's an interesting moment, I think, coming up on 20 years of marriage. And we've been together for 22. We were together about two and a quarter years uh, when we actually got married. And we were engaged for about, uh, I think, six months before we um, actually, you know, we got uh, engaged in April uh, and then... Uh, 2003 and then got married in October. Given that today is the day before my anniversary and my daughter just got her braces on, I got the question today, why did we choose Nicaragua? And man, this seems like a perfect day to kind of reminisce a little bit and go over what actually brought us to Nicaragua in the first place because Nicaragua actually forms a really large chunk of my wife and my life together. And it's not something I think about very often. And we've done some episodes previously and certainly seek those out. And we talk about the reasons that we love Nicaragua, reasons that we've decided to stay, reasons we decided to return. Now that we go into some really in-depth things about Nicaragua. And I think we cover those pretty well, both in general, why we love Nicaragua. I'll hit a few highlights, but I've done a couple great videos where we really go into in-depth. But of course, the low cost of living, uh, proximity to family, good time zone, incredibly great levels of safety, and a country that is both both at a personal level, the individual people who live here, as well as a government that really uh, provides good laws and processes and visas and, and procedures that make it incredibly easy and affordable and welcoming for North Americans and Western Europeans uh, to move and live here and potentially uh, work from here and digital nomad and all that. So it's, 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 a, it's a lot of things. And anytime you're going to look at moving or choosing uh, a new place, whether it's a short term, just, you know, six months here, six months there, or you're looking at a, a permanent life move or the possibility of one, you're looking at a lot of factors. There's basically never going to be a single factor that's going to make that decision for you, right? It's never going to be, well, the weather in this place is just so perfect. I don't care about anything else. That's, that's really never going to come up. It's that all of the factors of life have to come together. And that's one of the reasons why, while I love Nicaragua and I think it's a, a really great choice for people to consider, you have to, you really have to come explore. Even if every factor that I list becomes very important for you and all rings true for you personally, there's still so many tiny factors that may or may not make it just great or terrible that you can't necessarily uh, predict, right? There's just so many things like, oh, you know what? It's so perfect. I just don't like any of the fruit that they have, right? I've actually had people recently say that there's no good fruit here. And we're like, are you, are you what? Like, this is the land of fruit, but it's very different fruit than we're used to. In North America, I don't get good apples. I certainly don't get good pears. Getting blueberries is tough. Getting raspberries is, is pretty difficult. Strawberries we can get, but they're expensive. And there's so many things. Like, I love the fruit from back home, but I was raised with it, right? So of course I do. Uh, being here, wow, the pineapples are fantastic. The mangoes are beyond belief. There's a lot of fruits that we're just not getting back home. Papaya and, and guayaba and guayabana and, 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 you know, all these different things. And if you don't end up liking those fruits, for example, that simple thing that is really hard to tell you about over a video, uh, it could be a really big deal. If you've never had fresh papaya, describing it only does so much. Right. And, and for me, I like fresh papaya and, and coming here, I eat it far more than I ever did. And papaya is very good for you. So that's a good thing to like. My wife absolutely detests papaya. So that little thing you would never have guessed in either direction can be a major factor. But I want to talk today about what brought us to Nicaragua in the first place, why we ended up here, what from the outside and what life events and knowledge and, and things that we believed and knew about Nicaragua caused us to actually put it on our map and come here in the first place because we've never, to the best of my knowledge, talked about this on the vlog. Given that tomorrow is my anniversary, let's start at the very beginning. My wife and I got married in October 
2020, uh, 2003, wow, this is 2020, the, in 20, 2003, we had been dating for two, two and a half years, uh, about two and a quarter years, I guess, and uh, we were living in Geneseo, New York at the time that we got married. We had been living in Ithaca when we were dating, uh, and then we moved to Geneseo about the time that we got married and bought our first house uh, actually before the wedding, right? So we had a house, we had all of our stuff in it, we were ready to move in at the time uh, that we got married, and um, beautiful location, brand new house, directly and I mean directly behind my father's current apartment in Geneseo, New York. So his, uh, we, it, it wasn't built yet, right? So if we stood on our back deck and looked out at the field that our dog used to play in when we lived there, that is now where my father lives, right there. If we were still there, we could shout to each other. It's that close. Um, it, really interesting that he ended up in that so close to it, right? And my cousin lived right next to him at one point, never all at the same time. Like over the years, we've all lived within 150 meters of each other. Absolutely crazy. So when we lived there, when we were first married, we were quite poor. My wife worked overnights as a uh, hotel manager in small town hotels, is not a big thing. And uh, I had done the same thing previously, many years before, uh, and I was working at starting a new company. It had been around for a number of years, but we were still very small. There's only two or three employees through those years. I think we topped out around four during the first several years. So this was 2003. So we spent a lot of time at home, tended to watch a lot of television. Life was on a very big budget and I worked a lot. There was a lot of video games in that era. She played The Sims, I played Age of Empires. We used to have a lot of friends nearby because it's where I had grown up. It's where she had gone to college, uh, all in that area. So we had loads of friends that had been there for years. We had you know, this really deep relationships with people. So lots of people would come hang out. That's our early lives. In 2004, we spent most of that year volunteering at a, at a small nonprofit uh, K-12 school. In the in more or less in the area uh, and did a lot of teaching. I did all of the IT for them. We developed classes. I taught community classes. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. It was a really good educational year. And at the end of that year, um, we had some major job changes and life changes come in. But during that time, 2003, 2004, we spent a tremendous amount of our free time uh, dreaming about moving other places. I had already worked uh, all over the eastern seaboard of the United States for uh, my career. Um, she had traveled a little. We had spent time in Canada together. Uh, we had always done some amount of travel. I had had an office in Washington, D.C. when we first met. And so we would always run back and forth. She was used to traveling many states with me. Uh, so we always had this, like, we were very mobile people. We were very travel heavy people, but it was always in the US or US and Canada um, and pretty limited. And we both had a lot of aspirations for seeing the world. It was just something that we were both extremely interested in, but neither of us had a chance to do that at that point. So we would spend a lot of our free time watching shows at the time like House Hunters International, which of course is incredibly goofy and now we know is all fake. But even so, it's always been a great way to see other places and be like, what does that place look like? What do houses in that place look like? Of course, some of that's fake. So even that's not that meaningful. But during this window, we saw a show on House Hunters International about, uh, about Nicaragua. And now that I have lived here, I have no idea where this was. And I think it was fake completely because I have no idea where anything even looks like this. Now, 20 years later and at the time, yeah, I'm pretty sure they faked it. But <laughs> I think they filmed it in Costa Rica. But it was, it really got us thinking about Nicaragua as, boy, this is a place we could consider. And we had never thought about it before. Of course, we're both very educated and we both took Spanish. And so, I mean, we were familiar with Nicaragua as opposed to a lot of people who are like, I'm not sure where that is, right? It's really common um, when you talk to people in the U.S. especially that they will be like, is that a country in Africa? Is it in South America? And you're like, it's Nicaragua. Like this was in the news through our entire childhoods. This is a really important country in the region. It's physically important in how it connects things together, even if it had nothing going on politically or, or whatever. It's still physically a really important spot. Like, how do people not know Nicaragua? But they really don't. Uh, but that's, so that's always baffled us. Uh, but as people who knew Nicaragua, knew its history, knew everything about it, it from, a, from a U.S. propaganda or news perspective, seeing a show that, that showed Nicaragua, it was in no way what we had thought. And it really gave us a, boy, this is a part of the world that we clearly know nothing about and really would like to discover more about because it looked absolutely fantastic in the early 2000s and that shocked us quite a bit that that's what we were looking at right that this was this was a, a learning uh, potential for us but it never really hit our radar because we didn't have any resources if you imagine there's very few resources now imagine what it was like 20 years ago to learn further about Nicaragua and so it never became uh, a place that we were actively attempting to go but we started 
started talking about it and really both of us point to that episode during that time as being this really influential moment that it got us both thinking about Nicaragua and that would last with us for a very long time. At that time, we were seriously thinking about moving because we did have uh, nothing tying us to the region, and we started looking at Uruguay because at the time they were very cheap, very safe, and I had always had this drive to at least spend some time, if not move to Montevideo, uh, ever since I studied uh, Latin and South American culture in high school. Uh, Montevideo had always called to me. It seemed like a really great place, and because it was one of the cheapest places in Latin America, 20 years ago, uh, it really seemed like it had a lot of potential. So we did a lot of research on that, but it was so far away that it never really bubbled up. And that takes us to what happened in late 2014. I ended up taking uh, the largest server deployment project ever for Dell computers. Uh, and I was the head engineer on that project. And so I ended up going from doing volunteer work and running our own business. They did do it through our business. So this is our business growing, but they brought in our business and me specifically to oversee this t this project for the end of 2014. And so I spent uh, a few months working on that. It was very, very busy. And I had to go to the city, not New York City, to, to Rochester, New York, um, and, and work on preparing this project. And then uh, in, in midnight on December 31st, uh, 2014, when I thought the project was wrapping up and we had these plans that I had done this project, we had some money, um, we, we were, you know, growth, we had all, what are we doing in 2015? We were thinking about, like, maybe moving to Uruguay. And at midnight, the company that was there is like, well, wait, 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 you're, you're done? I'm like, yeah, my contract's up. We were working overnights just because of the way the project was. And I'm like, yeah, my, I was contracted up to December 31st. You guys are all good. You have everything you need. You're ready to start your project in the new year and uh, have a good life, right? Like, I was done. They had only contracted me for a few months. And they're like, this is not what we had thought. We thought we had hired Dell to have this team here for the entire project. And we're like, what? We thought we were training you to do it. We were not hired or spoken to in any way. We have a very discreet contract. It ends tonight. There is, we're not even employed by Dell starting to, you know, in two minutes, right? And they got into a panic call with Dell and came back and are like, nope, you guys are hired for the year. You're here for all of 2015. So my 20, uh, I'm sorry, not 2015, for 2005, this is almost 20 years ago. So I spent all of 2005 um, on the road for Dell doing a massive server migration across the entire Northeast United States. It was the largest they ever did, and I got to do it hands-on. I, I got to end up doing every step of it, from the initial planning to the pilot projects to actually running the entire project for over a year. And it was a, a really great opportunity. Um, and for me, some really important things happened from a non-job perspective. From a career perspective, it was very good, right? It, it really pushed us into different arenas and, and helped me grow and a lot of great things happened. But what, what was far more, I think, influential in the, in the grand scheme of things during that time was I had to do this engineering project. And what it ended up being is I would be in a different city throughout the Northeast United States. So different state, different city, you name it. They tried to clump things together. They weren't being ridiculous, but I was on the move constantly. So every roughly 48 hours, I would have to move to a new city for a year. And of course, I was home on weekends. They like, again, they weren't being ridiculous. It was a very reasonable project. But I worked overnights in a different city every day. So Syracuse, New York, one day, Ithaca, New York, the next day, uh, Binghamton, New York, the next day, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, the next day, right. And a lot of these were small towns, places I would never go uh, voluntarily, like you wouldn't choose these out of the way little places. Now, a lot of them in like New York, I've worked in because I, I worked all over New York, even by that point in my life, I had been everywhere. Uh, but getting into Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, uh, Ohio, Massachusetts, like we started getting into lots of places that I had never worked. And it was a really amazing opportunity because I would get there at night, I would work for a few hours. And then in the middle of the night, Night, because of the way the project worked, I had some free time. It wasn't enough to nap. It wasn't enough to go do anything interesting. And I didn't have to stay at the offices that I was at. So I was able to go out and start walking around. And most of the offices they had were in the downtowns of these small cities, or at least in interesting parts of the cities. So I would get two or three hours every single night that I was working to go out and walk. And I did a few things. I would walk the cities. And of course, this is the Northeast United States, which is very safe in general. Um, and the cities are old industrial cities in most cases, which are really interesting arch uh, architecturally, historically. Um, and so that was really interesting. And I knew very little about them other than just their generic American Northeast cities. And I also, about that time, had really gotten into Audible. 
which if you don't know, um, so prior to that, when I was young, I'd always listened to books on tape. I'd grown up doing that. My mom had recorded books on tape for me. It was a huge part of my life. When I got older and was working on the road and I was commuting between New York and Washington DC or South Carolina all the time, I constantly, I had hundreds of books on CD. I collected a huge library during that era and I would have them in the car. I'd books, right? Like actual books of CDs of books that I would keep in the car and I would listen to all these. I would listen to murder mystery novels. I listened to so many history books, so many nonfiction, so many um, anthropology books, science books, and they would engage me and it made me excited to or really enjoy my drive time. I loved driving different routes between the different places, getting to know all the little towns. So I had already done this exploration by car with listening to, to books on CD. And now when I was doing this job for this year, Year, I had books on Audible, so I started carrying a smartphone that was uh, right at the beginning of that. I actually had, um, at the time, it was an MP3 player uh, that had the little LCD screen, and I remember it so vividly. I love that thing. The battery would last for, you know, days, and all it did was play MP3s, and Audible would let you download directly to it, and they had all these features. This is before smartphones were, like, really taking off, and I could walk and just listen. I had this little thing in my pocket, so I didn't have to carry anything expensive. I didn't have to worry about things being stolen. It was fantastic. And I would walk and listen to these books and explore these cities. And I really got into exploring all these little towns at night and I would read all the historical markers and I'd walk through the historic downtowns. I'd go through the parks, I'd go through the little neighborhoods and really get to know the cities. It was a wonderful, wonderful learning experience from a travel perspective. And it taught me a lot about travel in the United States and history and a lot about myself and the things that I loved and, and really got travel and, and this kind of education of travel um, into my mind as, as really a big part of who I am. And, and now one of the things that I love most, one of my absolute favorite activities is exploring cities at night alone in the quiet and the cool because you get the better weather at night anyway and later much later when we would move to spain uh that's when i started walking cities at night again and it was the most cathartic thing it was so wonderful i know so many places in spain because i spent whole nights hour after hour after hour walking the cities alone and exploring every little street and there's no traffic and there's no people and you can stop and look at a building you can stop and read the signs you can take time to ponder the waterfront and go into places that maybe you're not supposed to go but no one actually cares and during the day you'll be like hey you're not really supposed to be there and at night they're like whatever you're just a person in the quiet and no one sees you and no one cares and and really explored cities and i think of like cadiz and sevilla and, and cordoba places like that that i really like i can walk those streets now years and years later. And I know all the little out of the way places because I put so much time into exploring these amazing locations. This is what gave me that. So I really got a emotional tie to travel in a way I hadn't before uh, during this time. So that was very important for us. That led us to early 2006. During that time, we had a few months where we were free after that project and we were back to our normal lives. And we were really considering, should we make a move and, and the idea of having done all that, we were really seriously mentally prepared to look at moving to Europe or Latin America. We'd done a lot of research at the time and felt that those are the places that would most likely make sense for us. We definitely wanted to go try something different. Uh, but right at the beginning of 2006, by February, right, so I was still 29 years old, uh, ended up getting a job offer, a really, really good job offer on Wall Street, which we thought was going to be very short. We thought I was filling in a gap and it ended up becoming a 10-year uh, project. But I, I uh, moved from upstate New York to actually in Manhattan. Uh, we lived in Jersey for a while and then in the Hudson Valley. So we got even more exploration, really got to know other areas, spent a bunch of time there and um, fell in love with the area. Not a place that we would want to stay, but we really enjoyed our time. It was a really interesting part of our lives. It gave us a lot of income, but it also made us very tired of being in the U.S. and we were very sad that we kind of got stuck. So when in uh, 2008, we were pregnant, we had had a baby, we were living in the Hudson Valley, and my job uh, gave us an offer of a move to Texas. We thought, well, this would be a great, you know, be closer to family and be a good job move and a good a lot of things. But we talked to the, the job and said, look, we're going to do this. But once everything's established and you don't actually need me in Texas anymore, because I was actually managing people there, 
we were going to move to Europe. And at the time, my job was like, yeah, we can do that because I had offices in Europe. And in 2007, just before this, um, because I had had offices in Europe, we went and I worked in London a little bit. I worked in Belfast a little bit. And we got this really great experience of going to Europe. And we're like, we love getting over there. Oh my gosh, we want to get back. And so when in 2008, we we're like, this is going to happen, right? We're, one way or another, we're going to Europe. That is on the cards. And they, did, they didn't make a promise, but they said, okay, we understand that's what you want, and we, there's every chance we can make that happen. So we moved to Texas. We lived in Dallas for a number of years, and by 2013, uh, about four and a half years later, uh, we said, okay, everything's stable here. We're going to move to Europe. And they said, yeah, we're not going to let you. And we said, okay, you knew the deal, so I quit that job. We didn't end up being able to move to Europe right away. We did look at a lot of jobs there, nearly took a few, ended up taking a job on Hedge Fund Row in Connecticut and moving back to the Northeast into our old house. Uh, that job lasted about a year, ended up getting a really amazing opportunity and ended up in a huge uh, fight over um, the ability to work it turns out anywhere in the U.S., uh, because I had worked in Sovereign Trust, they basically said you had no right to work in the United States anymore for a number of years. And they literally said, if you move to the far point of the country and try to work in a grocery store, we're going to sue you. And and my lawyer's like, we'll win, but we're going to win after a decade. Is that worth it? And we were like, that's a really rough fight. So we really looked at ourselves a lot, and we took we we ended up luckily with a lot of time to sit home on full salaries. We none of this was terrible, right? It sounds really tragic, and it certainly was stressful. But a lot of great things came out of this. And, and one of it was getting six months completely paid to stay home with the family. And we were able to get a lot of time together. Uh, Dominica was able to do some international travel during that time. She went to the Bahamas, for example. Well, I had to stay because of the potential work stuff going on. But I got to stay with the kids. And, and we got lots of time at home with the kids after having had a year of really bad, not so much time with the kids. So the kids remember this time where I wasn't home, but then immediately followed. It was, it was completely the opposite. We had so much time together. So when we played all of our early video games when Liesl was just learning to play and Luciana was young enough that she couldn't play but she was really into watching them with us and would really get into it so the three of us just this is when we became the three of us playing video games together I uh, was during this window during that time we looked at a bunch of jobs we talked about a bunch of things and basically Dominica my wife and I sat down and said you know we don't care about the career anymore that was great I made it to the top of the field. It's been fantastic. I have a lot of accolades. We're not in a position where I'm being fired. We're in a position where companies are suing each other over trying to get access to me. This is really rewarding emotionally at the end of the day. And the money sounded great until we started spending time with the kids. And it's like, what have we been doing? Like, this is so not important. We need to improve our lives, not get more money and not, not worry about some kind of fake career aspirations. And while I'm sure I would have loved the job I would move to, in no way am I giving a sour grapes. Like, I do wish I would have gotten that job. I do wish we could have done that. Like, I really think the people were going to be great. I had a lot of hope. It would have been fantastic. And so many ways and it was going to give us a move to Europe that was part of it they were going to give us offices throughout Europe and I was going to be able to base there uh, along with with New York I'd be in New York a lot but I'd be in Europe a lot and it was going to be we're going to put the kids and, and Dominica primarily in Europe and make that our home most likely in Paris but we didn't know for sure and and, and but we we really sat down and we're like you know what we've done so much we need to make it family time and we need to do these things that we've always wanted to do. And so we ended up taking a, a severance package and, and agreeing not to work in the U.S. for a very long time um, and moved to Europe as part of the deal. Um, they didn't care if we moved. They only cared that we didn't work. But moving allowed us to have a lot more freedom. And so that began our journey of moving abroad. And we started exploring other places and with a lot of time with the kids. Uh, and at first, I was taking some nonprofit jobs in Europe because we thought I needed to keep working in that way. And uh, but that only lasted about two years. And, and we said, you know, this isn't this isn't really working for us. At first, I was doing a nonprofit job. But that was horrific, so much worse, so toxic, so much more stress and just terrible people and unprofessional behavior and and sexist and racist behavior from West Coast US. It was so toxic. I cannot even begin to tell you what an awful workplace environment that was and why I will never work for a firm that's based in San Francisco like that horrible toxicity is is strong and it's very hard not to with the amount of stress and and housing problems and just awful work environment having been in the northeast and working in like new york and and that kind of stuff where people take their jobs seriously but they treat each other really well and then going to california where people just blow off their jobs and treat each other like crap it is such a different uh, just emotional environment and uh, as a northeasterner it's not something i'm cut out to handle it's a very 
culture of despair. Um, so I'd done that for a little bit and was like, no. And so we ended up being a writer and working for a bunch of technical writing, right? Really boring stuff, but but did some really great work, had a good year or two of that. Um, and, and that kept me busy. But during that window, we spent a little bit of time. We lived in Spain and then we went to Panama and I was still working. So Panama, we couldn't stay for very long because I had to do a bunch of work in the States. But this is where it gets important. We'd done a little bit of time in Spain and we're like, okay, we're starting to get our Spanish thing going. And then we lived in Panama for a little while. And we're like, all right, reinforcing the Spanish, uh, but not that much just because of the, the lifestyle in Panama. We didn't go out that much. And uh, so we were mostly hanging out with each other. And, uh, but we really liked Panama. We love Spain, obviously, but it had so many problems being so far from family and different time zone. It, it really uh, carried some negatives for us, not because of Spain, just because of where it sits on the globe. And Panama was just, we didn't know what to expect, and it was amazing. We absolutely loved our time there. We loved the country, we loved the people, we loved like the whole, like the weather experience and the ocean experience and that part of the world and just how it fit into things. And something was just really magical about, uh, magical about Panama. And I think part of it was that even though it's physically pretty close to the United States, it had a feeling of being kind of exotic in a way that even Spain did not. And we had, by this time, done a bunch of travel in Europe. Like, I'm leaving out a lot of bits of our journey. We had whole huge periods that we'll talk about in some other video where we had done grand tours and been all over Europe and, and all over different places and really had a good scope of what we liked and really knew how to travel. But living in Panama, even though pretty briefly, really gave us this, this hunger to know more about Latin America. And so I had to go back and work in the United States for a little bit. And on that trip back to the United States, really kind of took the toxicity to heart and was like, why are we doing this? Like, we don't have to work for a terrible company like this and just left. And, uh, and they tried to say I had to move to California. And I was like, I certainly do not. And we had been talking about returning to Panama because we liked it so much. But then we said, you know what? And this was a really important discussion for us. We sat down over a period of a few weeks and said we could return to Panama and just go to a different part of Panama because it was, wow, what a great place. Should we go to Costa Rica? And the answer was, you know what? It's so close to Panama. And it like physically, like it's only you know, a couple hours from where we lived is that, well, might as well just go back to Panama and Costa Rica, Costa Rica is expensive and it just didn't call us. And we said, do you remember all these years ago, we, we watched this like 12 years ago at the time, we watched this House Hunters International in Nicaragua was such an idea. And both of us were like, absolutely, I remember that. I've been thinking about that ever since. And, and we're just like immediately, we're like, let's find out. Let's skip to the next place. Skip over Costa Rica. Let's go to Nicaragua and let's keep discovering Central America because Central America seems like it has so much to offer us. Let's, let's really investigate it because um, we had been doing Europe first. And so we had already, we'd already done to, uh, I think at that point we'd been to like 10 or 11 uh, countries in Europe. So we had a pretty good feel for what we liked in Europe. And we absolutely love Europe. Like it's fantastic. But Latin America was like, there's so little known about it. Like we're really discovering it in a way we weren't with Europe. With Europe, we got there. It was like, yes, we already expected all these things. We knew exactly what was coming and it was great, but it was known. Latin America was like adventure, especially Nicaragua. And so uh, my wife did some research and she just looked at houses available for rent online and discovered this really beautiful house Los Arcos in Casa Los Arcos in Granada in the north uh, northwest corner of El Centro right against the river it's gone now the house is still there it's no longer a rental it's just a private house and um, she showed me pictures of it and I'm like that place looks fantastic a, a pool in the in the middle of the living room and it had enough space and the location was great we could walk everything we wouldn't need a car and and it was two bedrooms two giant bedrooms that had air conditioning we're like done and so we rented the place at an outrageous price even today it would be we got so screwed on that price and we felt it was a good deal at the time we were paid i think a thousand dollars a month and our utilities were like 450 a month we still talk about it we literally talked about it like yesterday how expensive that was now we could rent someplace like that just because we know the market, right? We know that that place should have rented for much closer to $400 and our utility should have been much closer to $35. Like it was crazy. They were, they were definitely stealing from us all over, but we loved the experience. We came and Nicaragua was an amazing experience. And I was no longer working for the toxic company at that point, which made it a lot better uh, than, than it even had been uh, for us, like personally. And the kids loved the pool and they loved the weather and they loved being able to just walk places. And they had a really good experience in Nicaragua. And we really got into video games again together. We had been doing video games, but it really was a, even more uh, congealment of like, this is a place where we can do the things we like to do as a family. Um, but we didn't really like Granada itself, it was, it just wasn't the right vibe for us. It didn't fit, but Nicaragua really did fit. And we spent a bunch of time discovering the country. We'd drive to Leon. We, we didn't do Managua, believe it or not, but we did Matagalpa, Hinotega, 
uh, Leon, Chinandega, El Viejo. Uh, we had done way up north, uh, 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 San Juan del Sur, Ometepe, Rivas. We'd done quite a bit of exploring and had a pretty good lay of the land. Um, when we then, we had a, a family emergency and we moved out of Nicaragua, uh, and that's what actually took us out. We may have stayed then. Had that not happened, it is possible we would never have left Nicaragua. I think we would have because we were so set on just exploring other countries, but we easily would have stayed many more months or possibly a few years uh, once we had been driven to do that. But because of the family emergency, we ended up moving to Galveston and living on the beach for a little while. And then once things settled down at home, we moved on to Europe again. I went on and had amazing adventures uh, in Greece and, and Romania directly after that. And, and it was uh, a blessing, I'm sure. But uh, Nicaragua had been this early idea and then such a good experience in 2015. And there was so much more of Nicaragua we wanted to explore that when we went and did Europe for a number of years and then had some time. So after a number of years uh, living in Europe, living in different places, we really had a chance to evaluate our lives. We really had a chance to think about what it was that mattered to us and which things we really enjoyed and which things um, made sense for us in a long-term rather than a short-term uh, learning or experiential mode. And our kids are getting older at this point and, and changing a bit. Uh, so in, in 2017, 2018, well, at the end of 2017 and all of 2018, we decided decided uh, we needed to be in Texas for a number of reasons. So we took a little bit of time back to the States, uh, which really drove home how much we didn't want to be there. It was great being able to see our friends and family who had been there. But in 2019, and during all this time, I was helping a friend of ours um, really look at where he wanted to move in the future, not quite right away. Uh, and, and in the research for him, Nicaragua really kept coming up as everything he wanted to have as a, as a check mark was Nicaragua. He wanted the weather here. He wanted the cost of living here. He wanted the freedom of work and just all those things. They made sense. Nicaragua was his, his best choice without having set foot here, right? On paper, Nicaragua was number one. So in 2019, we took the time for he and, and his wife and my best friend Rachel and I uh, came down to Nicaragua for uh, a little while and spent time in parts I had not spent time in before, in San Juan del Sur, which I'd been to, but I hadn't spent time there. I really got to know it and went back to Granada and did a little bit there and did some driving across the country. And that trip really gave me, first of all, it was the first really... Um, this isn't quite true, but it was one of the first times that I'd gone back to a place I'd lived in previously. During earlier in 2019, we had spent a bit of time doing a grand tour of Europe again with my nieces, uh, and we did stay in Crete. We didn't go exactly go back to our house, but we were very close. Did a, did um, a couple weeks in the same general area, and oh, it just flooded back how much we loved living in Greece and how much that that did have a home feeling to it, and how that I mean that was just fantastic, right? But it didn't quite give me a, we got to move back feeling. It was, a, I love it. I miss it. I got to visit again. I want to spend more time. Um, I, I think Crete will always be um, on our radar to some degree because it was, it was such a perfect choice. And, and we love Greece in general, but Crete so much more. And we spent time in Santorini and it was like, ah, this is cool for a vacation, but it's not. It is not Crete by any stretch. It didn't even begin to compare. And uh, uh, it was such a great trip. And you can watch, I did a video of that whole summer, a uh, video series called Take Flight with Scott, which you, if you go to my channel, this channel, and scroll down a little bit, there's like all my other channels, and it's the green one with the airplane flying off. Go watch those. Um, it's, you know, that's where I was learning to do video editing and stuff. And it was a lot of fun to do, but it was a great trip. And, and we learned more about ourselves on, on doing another whirlwind of Europe and, and visiting out so many places we had been to again. And, and that was just fantastic. But uh, after that, you know, coming to Nicaragua um, was different. It wasn't a whirlwind vacation kind of thing. It was really kind of living here for, for a week or two. And during that time, I was very much like, wow, I remember how much I love it now. And, and so many memories came flooding back and so much like I wish I had seen more. And it's such a great position because it was so, it's so easy, right? Two hours from the United States, oh, I can visit family so easily. Phones just work. Everything just works for us. And so I got back from the trip. And, and I said, you know, I really think Nicaragua should be our home base. Not that we shouldn't keep exploring the world, not that we shouldn't keep traveling, but why be based in the United States when it's high cost and it's scary and it's stressful and the healthcare is terrible. And it's like, there's no reason to be here. And, and like, we didn't even live that close to family, relatively close, but we no closer than we would be in Nicaragua and from, from a time perspective. And we're spending so much money. It's cheaper for us to fly up from Nicaragua than it is to drive from, from our home in Dallas. And, and people, 
the, the camera's moving because the dog actually laid on the tripod. He's being very sweet. I don't know why he's at my feet right now, but he decided he was hanging out with me, just my little Boston Terrier. And um, uh, like so many things, when you actually thought outside the box, it was like whatever reason we had for living in Dallas was actually better living in Nicaragua. Well, it's lower cost than New York. Okay, but Nicaragua is lower cost than Texas. Oh, true. We get better taxes in Texas. Yes, but even better in Nicaragua. Oh, true. We get better, you know, we get terrible healthcare in Texas. We get fantastic in Nicaragua. Oh, that's a big deal, right? There's so many things. And, uh, and so I, I came back and I said, you know, we really, I think we should think about this. We should really, and, and it took a little while, it took a few months of back and forth and talking about it and showing pictures and remembering what it was like and discussing what we had liked and what we hadn't liked and really getting a picture of what made sense for us. Um, but when we put it all together, there were two really just overarching driving factors. The first is we didn't want our home base to be in America. That was, the, that was the biggest thing. We had this pressure to get out, but we had only never left permanently because we hadn't found our forever location. So we had this emotional um, um, problem that kept us from just packing up and going. We felt like we had to make some really big decision before we moved. That was wrong. We had to stop and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why do we need to find the perfect place when we have found a number of places that are better? We know we can move to Italy or Greece or Romania or Spain or Nicaragua or Panama, and all of them are better. All of them are tried and true by us, improvements over where we're living currently. All of them are cheaper, all of them are safer, all of them we enjoy more. So it made absolutely no sense to remain in the United States, but emotionally it felt like we should because we owned a home, we had a life there, we had so many friends, like we were really tied to the whole thing. And it's worth noting that very quickly after the trip to Nicaragua, we barely made it back, started having this discussion, and my best friend Rachel had gotten an apartment right next to us, like walking distance away. And that was a big thing, like, oh, Rachel just made this huge commitment. She lives around the corner. She had lived with us in Spain, like, so she, she gets living internationally thing. And she was only there for a few weeks, which is crazy to think, because she moved in after we got back from, from Nicaragua, so in like December. And so by February, which is like eight weeks later, uh, COVID had hit and she was on the next thing out to Europe and she's gone, she's never come back. I mean, she's visited, but she was gone at that point. So we went from, Rachel, my best friend, was living around the corner and we had this huge commitment like she moved there because of us and we would go out several times a week. We were always hanging out. She was always at the house. I was always at her apartment. And then all of a sudden she was gone. And like the thing that had been uh, not just our tie to Dallas, our strongest tie of all of our ties. We had lots of ties in Kat that you know from the show. She lives in Dallas, but really far away from us in Dallas. And, and never moved like next to us, never did anything like that. Um, and she always wanted to move away. So it wasn't like she was a, like a big linchpin to, to Dallas because she was hoping to move somewhere else. Um, and, and so like a lot of things shifted all at once and went from being the thing that kept us there to being a thing that actually pushed us away. And because uh, she, did, she didn't just leave Dallas, she left the country, I moved to Belgium. Um, and, and so we very quickly were like, wow, like we really need to think this through using the U S as a base is completely insane. We're losing all of our money. We're losing all of our, our flexibility because of the high cost and because of the violence and the risk and all that. And then we got stuck because of COVID. So we had a long time to have this discussion where it didn't matter what we decided we were stuck. And, uh, and then the second piece, so we knew logically we had to leave the United States and, and that for you guys could be Canada, could be Western Europe, wherever it is, wherever it is, you're not feeling the vibe, right? Or wherever is expensive, you need to get out of there. You need, you, you make the decision. Okay. That's a bad place to make your decisions from. It doesn't matter, right? If we were coming from, from Texas and so we said, okay, look, we know we love, we'll say Crete because I just gave the example. We were back in Crete in 2019. Let's go back to Crete. It's cheaper than Texas. It's more freedom than Texas. It's safer than Texas. It's, it's our, we're happy there. The air, just like everything makes you happy. Let's go to Crete, rent a place, and then spend however much time it takes to make the next decision, right? And we, maybe we go for three months. Maybe we stay for 10 years. Maybe we, we buy a home and that's where we, we stay, right? And if I had to stay in Crete, I would be fine with that, right? Beautiful, wonderful, love it. That would have been a better decision than staying in Texas looking for perfection. How do you know when you find it? You don't. Find the best possible thing, upgrade, move again, within reason. Don't move every few weeks, but you know what I mean. Take your chances, keep upgrading, figure out what's better, 
make it better if that's the process you're looking for. I moved the tripod so the dog wouldn't hit it. He moved to be on the tripod again. I don't know what it is. He's laying on the tripod. I know when I take my phone and put it on the bed, no matter what, the dogs will go to my phone and lay on it. Doesn't matter if I've been using it recently, if it's been all night, one way or another, it is always under the dogs. It's become a joke that I can move the dogs by moving the phone or define where I want them to sleep. And it really works. If I want them in a weird part of the bed that they're not normally in, I can just put my phone there. They will go there and lay down. I have no idea why. It's so funny, but he's so cute laying at the tripod. And so this really important process of uh, don't get mired in trying to find perfection. Perfection is the enemy of better, right? And, and, and that's all you need, right? Get to better. Make sure you keep improving. That's the first piece. Now, the second piece, why Nicaragua? We, why not the U.S.? That was the first piece because that was what was really tying us down. Then why Nicaragua? Well, when it comes to trying to make that future decision, a lot of things about Nicaragua just worked. One is we could buy a home right away. Now, I don't recommend buying a home right away. We had lived here before. We had visited again. We did tons of research. We had a lot of reasons to be buying when we did. And uh, we did a lot of research and we're business people. Um, and we didn't do it to make money as a business. So there's a lot of factors came together and it was still really reckless. Don't just do that. But for us, it was important that we could uh, rent or buy whatever we needed immediately. We weren't tied down. We had some tax reasons why we needed to buy relatively quickly. And, um, and it meant we could move immediately, right? As soon as COVID let us go, we could go. We didn't have any tie-ins uh, to, to trying to get visas or anything like that. Nicaragua doesn't require that. Just show up. We'll figure it out after we get there. You have years to figure it out, and we're still figuring it out, right? So that was really important. And really low cost of living, even lower than Greece, lower than Spain, lower than Italy. So that was a bonus, right? If you're going to make a mistake, making a cheap mistake is better than making an expensive mistake. Really close to family. So we're not making any decision to move farther away from family. That was a tough one, right? If we'd have moved to Crete, we'd have been so far from family. Coming home for Christmas would have bordered on impossible. We easily would end up years we couldn't afford the flights or couldn't get the time away or whatever because the flights take a day, right? You got to fly from, you got to take a ferry from Crete to Athens. You got to take a flight from Athens to Istanbul. You got to take a flight from Istanbul to Houston. Like it's nuts. Here we can just drive to Managua. We're in Houston in two hours. Done. So all of that, there's, there's a lot of like being close to family because we weren't giving up that couple hour proximity. That was huge for us. Being in the same time zone as our family, the same one we had been in, really huge for us. The ability to work and, and not have any of that change, really big for us. There were so many things and we knew we loved Nicaragua. Easily, we could have gone to Guatemala and loved that too, but we didn't know Guatemala uh, in, in the same detail. And now knowing both places, I still prefer Nicaragua, but I love Guatemala, right? Like I know there's more options that I'd be happy with, just like Greece would be fantastic too. But here we really found the mix of things that allowed for business and, and personal and location and family and where we originally come from. Now, if you're coming from Germany, some of those factors will favor somewhere else in Europe or somewhere in Africa, not somewhere in the Americas, but other factors may draw you here, right? So that's important. But for us, we're coming from Texas and, and this is so close and so easy to do that. So it was these two factors. It was the push from the United States, pushing us out to go somewhere. And Nicaragua was pulling us in and saying, we have the mix of things. We didn't need to make the decision that Nicaragua was the absolute perfect place. It was the perfect place right then and still is. But what if that changes? That's fine. That's the magic of what we're doing and what a lot of you, not all of you, but what a lot of you can think of when you're making these decisions. What if you move to Nicaragua? What if you pack up your life in the United States, Canada, wherever, and you move to Nicaragua? Now, do your research, you do your due diligence, you know that you can afford it, you know that it makes sense, you know that you're going to at least like it, right? You've visited, you're excited, you, you have a really good idea of what you're getting yourself into. But what if it's not perfect? What if? Is it better? Then how bad of a decision can it be? Move down and be like us. Keep evaluating. What if we discover that Colombia is so much better sometime in the future? I don't anticipate that, but what if we did? What if Colombia was 50% the cost and gave us a whole bunch of cool things and we just fell in love and we're like, well, I can't return from Colombia. Well then, by living in Nicaragua for all this time, we're in a better position to move to Colombia in the future than we would be had we stayed in the United States. We'll have more money, more flexibility, and we'll have had a better life in between, a dramatically better life, right? 
that's the thing. We're doing what it takes to give us the best possible life that we can evaluate. And we're not tied down. By coming here, you're not making a permanent decision. It may feel that way. It often feels that way, but it is not what's happening. You're making a temporary decision for the current time. Yes, there's some cost to moving. So, you know, you may spend $10,000 moving from the United States and you may have to spend another 10,000 to move from Nicaragua to somewhere else. So you don't wanna do it just willy nilly, but you also want to constantly improve. What if in the long term you can find a way to live so much better that it's worth spending than $10,000? Well, evaluate it and then make that decision. But that's, that's why we chose Nicaragua. Right? It was all the right factors given a lot of research, both from a distance and in person. We put in a lot of time and we decided where we were coming from didn't make sense. Of all the places we could go to, it made the most sense. There's lots of places we'd be happy. And hopefully there is for you too. The world is a big, exciting, beautiful place, full of nice people, full of great food, really interesting places. There's so many places I want to see yet, so many. I want to spend lots of time in Africa and Asia and South America, but I'm also going to miss my dogs and I have to balance things, right? Living in Nicaragua lets me give the best life to my dogs, lets me have, when I do travel, they have the best support network and I can afford to have security and support to ha so afford to have really good health care for them, right? That's important. Nicaragua gives me more flexibility than just about anywhere else I would live while giving me so little uh, problems from living so far away. There's some amazing places in the world that could, if you don't have the same time zone issues as me or need to work remotely as me or family to go see, maybe Thailand is fantastic for you or Laos, right? Maybe Uganda or Rwanda or Tanzania, Right? There's all kinds of really interesting, amazing places that might be just fantastic and maybe you should explore them. But there's also a bunch of things you can do to figure out which things are likely to be good for you. For us, being able to speak Spanish, also very important. And I've done videos that on all the reasons that we think Nicaragua really works out for us and why we think we're going to stay. Right, But we don't have to stay. We don't need to stay here to, for it to have been a success. This move for us has been a success already. We got the place that we want to live. Our kids are being raised in a place that we love. We're, we're safe and secure and free and affordable and close to family. And people, when they want to come visit us, can do it so easily. It's easier for family in most places to visit us here than it is when we lived in the United States. Right? That's one of the things that blows people's minds. Now, our family who, if we had friends in Dallas, right, that could come over on any night for dinner, well, yeah, it's harder for them to see us, but we didn't have that many. And those that we had, a lot of them moved, right? Because we're at that age where people were moving. So there's not that many that would still be there. And for those that are farther afield, like our family in Houston, their ability to visit us here is just about equal to when we were in Dallas. Uh, we live less than two hours from the airport here, and the flight is about two hours. The drive is about four hours there. Yes, flying to another country in has some other overheads. But if you're coming for a weekend or longer, most of those things become background noise. Coming here would be vastly cheaper and more exciting. We have more space here. We're able to house family. So family can visit us here cheaper for longer, more easily than they could go to our house in the United States where we didn't have space. Sometimes they have to stay at a hotel down the street like it was crazy. And the cost of the drive is not that much different than the cost of the flights. Okay, technically the flights are more, like I'll give you that. But overall, it's a better experience coming here. It's easier. And that's the family who is really close. Anyone who's farther than Houston, any of our family from Ohio or New York or anything like that, it is vastly easier for them to come visit us here. I mean, by huge margins, much cheaper, much easier. And we can house a lot of people, a ton. If I had every one of my cousins and every one of their kids come visit us, they could all come stay with us all at the same time. And it would be a full house, but we could do it. It wouldn't be a major problem. And we have a cook and we have a maid and we have all kinds of resources and we have a gated community and you can bring dogs and they get, there's space. It would be hard to bring dogs. Okay, that would be tough, but you could, right? Just so many things. And by coming to visit us in Dallas, it was, ugh, Dallas, why? Great place to live, but terrible place to visit. But coming to Nicaragua, we live by the ocean. We have beaches, we have volcanoes, we have views, we have museums, we have all kinds of interesting things to do. 
So you get basically amazing free vacations while getting an easier time coming to visit. Simple things like that are huge wins for our situation for Nicaragua. And when you're looking at places you want to live, think outside the box. A lot of those places may not be as difficult as you think. Others may be much harder. Consider all the factors, right? But that is why we chose Nicaragua. I hope that makes sense. I hope that uh, if you've got questions, scroll down, ask away. Uh, love to explain more about all the different decision factors and, and answer your questions that you may have about you coming to Nicaragua. Uh, but here on our coming up on our 20th wedding anniversary, this has been an amazing journey for us, right? We've been here now for more than two and a half years. This feels like home. It's hard to imagine moving anywhere else. We still want to visit the world for sure. I plan to do a lot of travel for the show. I love traveling and tours and relocation and that's stuff I really want to spend more time on. Uh, but Nicaragua has been an absolute slam dunk success for us. I don't think in any way any of us, including my children, have any regrets on coming here. They are thrilled with that decision. And every time we ask them, they're like, no, this, we love it here. This is where we want to be. And that may, that may change in the future. Of course, they change. Nicaragua changes. The world around changes. Other places change. But for what we can tell, this has been great, continues to be great, and is projected to stay great. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe, watch another video, tell your friends. If you'd like to support the channel, buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. We'll put the link on the screen. It's down in the description. You can always buy my book. It's technology, so it's not for everybody, but if you want to check it out, really appreciate it. Some of you do buy it every week. It really, really makes a difference. It means a lot to me. Thank you. And I will see all of you tomorrow.